Vikas, can you hear me? Hello, Vikas. Hi, Vikas, can you hear me? Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Can you hear me, Vikas? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sound is not coming for some reason. The sound is going a bit. Now, one minute, just wait. Your sound is coming to my. It's not coming in my ear. Yeah. Just say something. I Vikas say something again. No, the sound is echoing. Okay, is it better now? Ah, yes, sir. Okay, all right. I have got I've got three screens running today, so I'm trying out a new setup. <laughs> So that's why I don't know where the camera is. There are three cameras and I'm trying to work out which is the camera I have to look at. <laughs> okay, I'll make it easy. I'll just get... Okay, I just called Dr. Asgar and uh, he was under the impression that this would have been... 5.30, so he's just logging. Okay, okay. You know, I, I think that Indian Association also sends the invite, invite and uh, so unfortunately it confusing for them because uh, they have Indian time rather than the GMT. Okay. So it gets a little confusing, but that's all right. Okay, so that's okay. I'm now in the screen and I can see. You think you'll be ready for uh, Wednesday? Yes, sir. I can be ready, sir. Okay, that's good. Then Wednesday will schedule you. Some people said to discuss uh, my test diagnosis in pregnancy also, uh, but uh, already the talk is very big. So I think the, uh, just recently guidelines have come for management of cardiovascular disease in pregnancy uh, uh, from. Both H and ESC. Sound is not okay. Sound is too crackly. Yeah, it's equal. Yeah. Is it is it because of your connection or what is it? Your sound is more crackly than before. I'll, I'll just check. Sir. I'll just check. Sir. Your voice is breaking. Is my voice clear to you? No, sir. Is my voice not clear? Yes, sir. It's clear, sir. I mean, I'm hearing it clearly. Rest can you hear clearly? Okay, good. Yes, sir. So then Vikas, probably your yes, setup. Yeah, yeah, I will send the Wi-Fi. I don't know what is the problem, but there's definitely a crackle on the on your sound. My, my I don't know if my sound is clear or not. Uh, that's why it's good Arif to tell me that. Congratulations to all the youngsters who have passed DNB thoracic surgery today. So I'm just waiting for uh, Asghar to log in. So give me a few minutes. Uh, I hope he can log in quickly. Hi, Kamran. Assalamu alaikum. Good to see you. 
you need to switch your mic on. <laughs> Very good, there we are. Hey, how are you doing? Very well. You... We've, we've been busy doing some uh, on the topic risk stratification. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> Have you guys been doing some sessions? Hmm? Have you been doing some sessions or some teaching or oh, just doing some uh, operating emergency uh, operating and uh, we had to employ various risk stratification models. I'm on call oh, on all right. Friday to Monday, so this is um, uh -huh. interesting. Yeah, that's another world, isn't it? The on-call world. Are you operating at at uh, your place or some other hospital? We operate nowadays. It's Pan London, isn't it? We were Pan London. So on Tuesday, I operated at Harefield. Wednesday at St Thomas's. And then yesterday I operated here, but now we're on call for emergencies. So, yeah. <laughs> How about you? Uh, me, I, I have been uh, busy this week with lots of my clinics and things, but my operating sessions are all, as I told you, are all private. So at the moment, private practice is very, very quiet because nobody can travel. That's the problem. So most of my sessions, are, I've, I've, I've got people writing to me that they will fly me out, fly me in, but I am not willing to fly because it does mean, yeah, it's, it means 14 days uh, restriction on the other side and 14 days this side as well. So the Middle East is very, very keen that I go out there again. So Dubai has just started their flights. So have they? Right. Yeah, they've literally just started their flights today. So we'll see how it goes. I'm waiting for Asghar to log in. I haven't had him on as yet. So we're just getting to five o'clock. I think he was under the impression it's 5.30. So he I'm said five. Waiting. I spoke to him not long ago. You did? Okay. I spoke yeah, to him about half an hour ago. Yeah, I, I called him just now. As soon as I logged in and I didn't see him, I called him. And he said he's trying to set up and log in. So we'll just wait for him. Did you have to go to Bart's as well, uh, Kamran? We didn't go to Bart's. I think Hammersmith went to Bart's. Um, so okay. we, we were sort of sent to Hairfield because we've got an association with them now. Yeah, I they, heard that. I heard that Brompton is, uh, is, is changing its trust and things like that. It's all becoming it's Guys and St. Thomas's. Guys and St. Thomas Trust is in the process of taking over or the trust joining, but we don't know the practice. It's still very early days. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? It's just all. I mean, I I remember I remember Harefield joining Brompton in those days, and it was so much chaos. I was working at Harefield when we joined Brompton, and then that was uh, a legendary uh, days. I remember seeing Mr. Zamir Khan's notes. I worked for Ascot Adani. If you oh, Brompton. you did. All right. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, yeah, it was good. It was a good time, I tell you. Working with Magdi was one of the one of the best experiences of my life. The guy had phenomenal, uh, you know, work ethics, and it was just amazing. Uh, where is Asda? Oh, I'm waiting for his login. Probably give him a call again. Give me a second. Do any of your 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 viewers have any questions, any topics? Any, you got yeah. lots of. Uh, yeah, they have just logged in almost everybody, so they are warming up. Uh, so I'm not sure right. if they have got things lined up, but uh, let let's see what what they have to say. Like, give me a second. Let me get Asghar. Of course, of course. Yeah, hi, welcome, Islam. Asghar, are you happy? Are you happy to log on? Okay, all right, thanks. Thanks. No, that's all right. It's okay. Thanks. Uh, bye.
is just is is just setting up. So yeah, guys, anybody has any questions for Kamran? He's already here with us. Uh, As Asgar is setting up. Uh, so wh while he's setting up, we can we can come on. Give us a few tips on uh, on uh, you know your style and your strategy for uh, uh, risk stratification. So uh, Oscar will give a very good introduction, I'm sure. But risk stratification is a topic that we as cardiac thoracic surgeons we can look at it from various ways. But whenever I do any teaching, whether it's you know all levels of teaching, I think it's a very practical approach. We have to do it, how we're going to use it in day-to-day -day practice. And our practice has been shaped in the last two decades, essentially by many changes in technology, but also what's happened is, is the risk profile of our patients has changed. So we are now operating on a lot more complex patients, multiple comorbidities. There's a lot more scrutiny. So with all of these various factors coming in, ultimately we have to do what's best for the patient. We have to be safe. We have to offer them the most effective treatment and we, we're also challenged by doing it with the lowest risks and not just in mortality, but morbidity. So it comes to the, uh, at, the at the outset, what risk stratification relates to is essentially the uh, informed consent. You know, patients come to us before we had this philosophy that medicine was very paternalistic, whatever we said, and even in some parts of the world, that's still the case. It doesn't matter what, what the risks are. Patients don't want to know, or sometimes they'll say, Look, just do what you have to do, but we have to be very open and we have to tell the patient what is your you know, particular risk uh, of a procedure. Uh, and, and that comes to what we explain the risk. The most important risk is mortality. There are other scoring systems which look at morbidity and that's come from other specialties. But essentially that the risk spread education, how we use it on a practical day-to-day -day level is firstly to identify what the risk is of operating on a patient. And I had to use that just two days ago. So on Friday, I was asked to see a patient. We're in an era now where there are many different modalities of, of treating very sick patients. We can operate on patients for very routine conditions, such as aortic stenosis, ischemic heart disease. And those patients are, are categorized based on scoring systems. There's also alternative therapies now. And those alternative therapies are being more and more developed and applied to all sorts of patients. And when we have to see a patient, we have to assess what are the risks and benefits in each procedure. And when we have to assess surgical risks, we can use a gut feeling and intuity and instinct. You know, we get an idea some patients are prohibitive, some patients are extreme, some patients are inoperable, but we want to have some objective because when we're explaining to the patient or their relative, what are the risks? And so I, I had a patient who was 71, came with cardiogenic shock. So so, come, come on. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, as Asgar has Asghar managed is right. to log in. So if, if you don't mind, can I just stop fine, him fine. Again, sharing fine. his slides? Fine. So and then we'll get you in again fine, uh, fine, once fine. we've got us. So uh, hi, Asgar. Uh, good evening. Are you with us? Um, hello. Um, can yeah, you all hi, hear me? Yeah, we Hi. can hear you. Now, two things you need to do. Number one is start your camera, which is at the at the bottom to the left side, yeah. the uh, camera yeah. icon. So then we've yeah. got your icon. Excellent. And now if you look at the green button, you will see a share screen button. Yeah. So you need to yeah. share your screen and then uh, please uh, share your slides and, yeah. and just wait uh, for one second because I need to start the recording because we record everything. So it's always a good idea to yeah, I'm, uh, I'm uh, so, a bit sorry for inconvenience because I had that, it on right. other, no, don't other uh, computer. Now I'm doing it on a different computer. So that's okay. Getting, don't worry. Technology uh, always gives us. <laughs> <laughs> it has benefits, yeah, yeah. but it has disadvantages as well. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. You, you are the highest end technology user because you're a robotic surgeon. So <laughs> none of us can even claim to be. <laughs> Uh, you know, as, as techno savvy as you are, <laughs> he, sh he, sh he should have got a robot to do his presentation. You see, this is the I key. Know, he should have. He should have. Yeah. So when I when I click here, share screen, it says host yeah. disabled participants. Okay, screen. just just hang on. I will I will give you the I'll give you the hosting rights. Okay, just one second. Um, all right. So now I've given you the hosting. Uh, I've given you the sharing screen rights. Uh, so please. Uh, 
uh, go ahead and share your screen and then we'll take a couple of minutes before I start uh, recording and then we'll uh, start the relay. Okay, so I share screen or sh I share uh, presentation? I'm clicking Click presentation. The... Share the presentation. If you've got it already open on your uh, desktop, it's, it's, then already... share. it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Give us a second. Excellent. And now go into uh, slideshow. Okay, so now I'm I'm a Mac person, and this is yeah. yeah. I just we're we're me. all Mac we're all Mac buddies. <laughs> so, but they can so just the slideshow at the top. Thing. Yeah, that's right. Just go into slideshow. Uh, see no, you no, made it no. in Keynote, which is always good to see. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. So uh, give me one second, I'll just start recording. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another session of uh, Thoracic Gurus. And, and really, it's my honor and my privilege to welcome uh, our friend on this uh, platform. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Asghar Nawaz in the UK, as you know, once you, you know, you finish MBBS, you become a doctor. And then when you finish your FRCS, they put you back and they make you a Mr. So Mr. Asghar Nawaz is a consultant cardiothoracic robotic and transplant surgeon at the Matter Miser Corday University Hospital in Dublin. Uh, he is uh, he's a post CCT uh, robotic surgery fellowship. Uh, he has also done transplant fellowships, uh, has done uniportal VATS at Shanghai, and now is actively and and uh, actively pushing the program of. Uh, of cardiothoracic surgery uh, in Dublin. Asghar, uh, you, you're gonna tell us all about risk, risk stratifications in cardiothoracic surgery. Welcome to this group. And uh, let me tell you that uh, the people who are logged on is a mixed bag of uh, um, trainees, uh, residents and uh, surgeons, uh, already qualified surgeons in practice. You are also going live on YouTube uh, and you're also live on the Indian Association of Cardiothoracic Surgery website. So a lot of senior surgeons are also looking towards you for getting guidance on how to do risk stratification for their patients. Thank you very much. Uh, take, take it away. Okay. Thank you very much. And um, thanks for your kind introduction and also kind in invitation to join this such a nice platform. Um, so we'll, I'll try to keep a presentation at a level that you know we all can be equally participating into this, um, being this as a mixture of trainees and from the consultant surgeons. Uh, so the today's, um, uh, my presentation is gonna be break down into two. Uh, the main topic is basically risk stratification, but I've broken it down into cardiac surgery as well as the thoracic surgery. So this is, uh, as the name implies, is an important and interesting topic. And as you all know, cardiothoracic surgery uh, carries a high degree of perioperative uh, mortality or perioperative risk as compared to any other medical or surgical intervention. And the goal of the risk stratification is to count broadly for differences um, in patient characteristics uh, that affect outcomes of interest. Now, risk stratification can be used for uh, the production um, of the guidelines or profiling the practices or, uh, and indication of the uh, surgical procedures. Risk stratification has an important implication on the consent process as well. Um, now, looking at the history, the, there are two general ways uh, to risk stratify called risk scores and risk equations. The risk scores, um, if you look at the old literature, um, the risk scores were reported that uh, were based partly uh, on the data, but mostly on to the uh, expert opinion or the surgeon's experience. Unless a score is specifically um, uh, calibrated to the outcome, it is merely used for risk stratification. 
and certainly not for the uh, absolute risk at all. The risk the, the initial use of these risk scores were broadly um, uh, classified to patient mix to, to, to you know, calculate their outcomes. But subsequently, they were used for um, uh, reimbursement, quality assessments, um, and the comparisons, um, you know, and all other gen uh, generic things but not for the generation of knowledge, you know? And that's why the, the use of risk scores was, although welcomed by the same time, it was distrusted uh, as well. On the other hand, the risk equations, uh, they, they are more scientific according to me because they, you, they use the multivariate analysis um, um, to develop these equations, uh, um, usually by the logistic regression. So the equation is used to calculate the absolute uh, 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 risk of um, uh, risk of these patients as well, and then you can classify these patients and sort them out in, according to low risk or high risk. Now I'm going to take you slightly back to your medical school. Um, sorry, let me just take the screen out of my view. Yeah. To, to the medical school. And if you look at the oath that we took um, when we were in the medical school, it may be different wordings in different parts of the world. Basically what it said as a summary was that I will fulfill this oath to the best of my knowledge and to the best of my power uh, to the benefit of patients and not for the injury or causing any wrongful purpose. And if you look at, I've put also the GMC um, publication here as well. And if you look at it, what it says is first do no harm. I think this is a very important and a really, really strong message here. And this makes the basis for our risk stratification as well. Now, looking at the history, uh, specifically at the cardiac surgery side, um, the propensity towards data collection uh, in cardiac surgery was reinforced in 1970s. And th this mostly came from the cardiologists who were um, um, looking at that the surgeons not only just show the symptomatic um, uh, relief of these patients following the procedures, but also mortality as well as long-term quality of life. And this resulted in one of the largest um, uh, uh, funded registries and research databases um, to study the patient with the ischemic heart disease. And you could say a rather restrictive uh, randomized control, a control trial of that time, which is called the CAS study the coronary artery bypass surgery for ischemic heart disease. And it was published in circulation in 1981. And um, you look at this second um, you know, line of my slide and it says, cabbage have been the most completely and quantitatively studied therapies in the history of the medicine. And I think this gives us an honor and the privilege that we could uh, say that whatever we are doing is evidence-based. Now, why, why do we need to have these risk uh, models um, or risk stratification? They are used to predict the outcomes, as I said, after the cardiac surgery. And not only the risk model applied in the assessment of these uh, relative impacts, but they also have um, impact on the surgical outcome and the patient counseling, um, selection of the treatment, um, and uh, comparison of the, uh, the options that you offer to the patients. And uh, Cole uh, published a paper in the European Heart Journal in 2006 um, on a topic called importance of risk stratification model in cardiac surgery. And there is a really good message uh, which I put in italics here. And it, 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 is, it is important because it says risk stratification being as essential to the surgeon as knowledge of anatomy and the technique. 
The first model, uh, uh, the widely used model was the Personet score, which was uh, based on uh, retrospective analysis of the data which was collected in 1980s. Uh, the risk model since the uh, modeling since then has been highly influenced by the by the technology by the advances in the uh, diagnostics uh, by the interventions um, and now you know the cardiac surgery um, is is in a very competitive environment and um, and the uh, sur surgeons really really have to take the important um, Myers before they finally give their final decision for the management of a patient. At least about 19 risk stratification models are now in, in practice in various parts of the world. Some are commonly used, some are relatively uncommonly used. Uh, they have been developed in the, in the various parts of the world as well, but mostly is the European and the uh, North American regions that have worked on to these models. And the focus of these models um, was originally uh, on the prediction of perioperative mortality, okay? Mortality only, that's what they were based on. And because and those, and on those times, mortality was an important uh, factor. However, major morbidity uh, is in general more common than mortality. And uh, the ability to predict the outcome should also involve the uh, de determination of the morbidity that comes with surgical intervention. So six risk models um, um, have therefore, um, in some instances, for example, the, uh, the STS score have expanded to allow for the calculation of the uh, post-operative morbidity as well. The most commonly used models in practice uh, are the three, the Euroscore, the STS, and the Personet score. Euroscore, as the name implies, and as you can see, stands for the European System for Cardiac Operative Risk Evaluation, and the STS is um, uh, following the name of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons um, Algorithm and the Personet score. The Euroscore aims to construct uh, a scoring system that predicts the early uh, mortality following cardiac surgical procedure. And it was developed in, the, in, a, in a large um, um, European study, which was conducted in, um, in eight countries and that included over 13,000 uh, patients. And this was uh, done in 1995. And the validation of the score since then has taken place almost all over the world in a variety of uh, population settings. Um, I don't know how accurately we could imply them in different parts of the world. Say, for example, if you're treating a patient in the European uh, country or in North America, or on the other hand, an Asian country like China, India, or Pakistan, but because these models were studied here, they've been widely practiced. Somehow, I would say they are still useful in clinical practice. Euroscore um, model has uh, three methods of calculating the score. Um, the simple editor model and the, uh, the early logistic uh, model, they are kind of almost obsolete now um, since the development of the Euroscore two, um, which uh, is more recommended and more widely used in clinical uh, practice. These, e each of these models have some advantages and disadvantages. And I remember during my exam preparation, you know, you needed to have something in your fingertips so that when you're seeing the patient in the clinic or when you're discussing with a colleague in the corridor or when you're in, in the exam, you have something simplified version that you can quickly calculate in your mind. I think the this is where the use of the simply additive model comes into, into use. So I would, although they are absolute, obsolete, I would say they are still useful um, to, you know, to study and uh, to use them. The additive uh, model basically 
Um, as you can see in this table, takes into account of three main things, um, which is called patient-related factors, the cardiac-related factors, and the operative-related factors. And it gives points to each thing, uh, which is visible. And I'm sure the, our uh, colleagues have um, you know, used this model before in practice. And as you see, some things have um, relatively less points. The, some, some of the conditions have higher points. The highest point goes to the, if you're conducting the surgery on the thoracic aorta, which gives you the four points. So this, this generally gives you an idea when you're sitting in clinical practice um, to give a rough estimate in talking to the patient. The logistic Euroscore, on the other hand, um, uses a logistic regression model in calculation of the score in a slightly complex way. And this is used from the equations. And there is an online calculator available from the Euroscore. We, you know, we use that, um, go online or have an um, app downloaded onto your mobile phone, uh, and then it can calculate it for you. The Euroscore 2, um, which is um, more common in practice, as I said before, this has been in practice since 2011. It was presented in this uh, EX meeting in, uh, in Lisbon at that time. And this model uh, is now um, widely used and widely recommended. And again, uh, as you can see on here, if you go online, it really gives you calculation of the uh, operative modality um, within seconds, if you know the patient's uh, characteristics. On the other hand, the STS um, um, uh, algorithm, um, which was created in 1989 and has become the, the clinical database, uh, uh, largest clinical database of its kind, and the primary aim for the development of the STS model was for the support of the national quality programs. But now it is also being used in the research um, as well as the patient care and patient outcomes. Um, the risk model, which the STS uses uh, for cardiac procedures, these were developed in 1999s um, and has since then gone under uh, periodic evaluations um, the STS uh, database uh, does not predict the possible morbidity either, and it doesn't take into account the, the, any relation to the intraoperative variables either. Now, the third is the personnet score, uh, which was first uh, described in 1999 um, by the Victor personnet. Um, it was to construct a straightforward a uniform reporting system for levels of operative mortality uh, risk in all cardiac surgical uh, procedures. And this was conducted in US and has studied over 3000 patients. Um, the data was collected initially uh, around the um, 1980s. But again, this uh, has uh, retrospectively, retrospectively uh, analyzed and included the uni and the multivariable uh, logistic regression models. This model um, has also gone modification and the latest modification was carried out in 1994 or 95 and taking into account of 30 new risk factors which was included into the new model. And this is called the modified personnel score. Again, like the Euroscore, like the STS algorithm, the personnel score does not uh, address or has no relation to the uh, morbidity or prediction of morbidity or, or morbid events either. Now, if I, if I just, well, you know, there are some of my junior colleagues as well and I, would like to address here that why do we need to use these models, which has their uh, own advantages and disadvantages? Um, why why do we need to use them into practice? And and there is a reason for using them. It's um, 
it is not only to you know make an informed consent not only to uh, speak to other colleagues when you're uh, recommending the procedure or making decisions in the multidisciplinary meeting. Um, but the, there is a disadvantage as well. Some disadvantages has been discussed that this has led uh, to something which is called um, a risk aversion. I will discuss um, at this point slightly later in my presentation. Um, but uh, that is not the point here. The point here is making judgment or making decisions. I'm going to take you a condition called the aortic dissection. Now, as you know, the, uh, the aortic condition has type A aortic dissection, type B aortic dissection. And everyone, uh, you know, even as a cardio, cardiothoracic trainee knows that the recommendation for the um, type A dissection is surgery. The recommendation for the type B dissection is conservative management. Why do we say that? And what is the evidence behind it? And why, why, why do we give this message? And this message is based on the knowledge and the data which we have collected. So the type A dissection has a mortality without surgery of 90%. And the operative mortality or the surgical mortality is about 10 to 20%, depending on uh, every individual patient. And when you look at the five-year follow-up uh, of uh, type A dissection patients, there is a five-year survival of um, uh, 60% for type A dissection patients when they undergone surgery. On the other hand, for type B aortic dissection, why do we not uh, take them into, um, into theater? There is a reason and a rationale for uh, not operating on these which is that the mortality with the medical management for type B is 10% as compared to the operative mortality of 27% plus the risk of paraplegia, which counts 24%. And not only this, when you look at the five-year survival following this, um, and you don't see much improvement there either. And that's why, you know, we tend to operate on type A dissection and not operate on type B. But obviously this varies from, there are certain indications where specific centers do operate on type B in certain conditions. But I was talking about just the generic uh, overview of the type A and B. Similarly, for severe mitral regurgitation in asymptomatic patients who have got good LV function, would you operate on it? Generally, you would say no. And um, the guidelines say no as well, because this has not really affected onto the LV of the patient. But having said that, if you look on to the, the current evidence now, there is a class 2A indication to operate for this specific group of patients. Now, that specific group of patients, which has a class two indication, has uh, indication only in special circumstances. And that is that this case, these cases should be done by a mitral surgeon uh, in, a, in a center which has more than 90% successful repair rate. Okay, so this is where you know, the implication of these risk stratification models come into because they help you for the decision making. And uh, earlier on, we were discussing, you know, uh, the, the, these risk models, although they help us, they have their disadvantages as well. And the disadvantages in the recent medical literature, as well as in the general public news, you would have seen there has been debate going on about the what is called a surgeon specific mortality data. And that has led to the risk aversion, which means avoiding in certain circumstances, avoiding operating onto the high risk patients. Um, because when you're going to publish the individual surgeon results, um, naturally they would tend to avoid it. Again, this is a debate, uh, you know, there is um, 
so many said in the meetings as well as in the literature that the data published should be reflecting the unit practice rather than the individual practice. The debate is ongoing. I'm not saying which is the right or which is the wrong thing, but generally this is what it has led to. This is one of the disadvantages of this risk model as well. And I had the pleasure to work with um, uh, Mr. Nashaf when I was um, in Pepworth. Um, he has published the book, The Naked Surgeon. It is an interesting read. And if you see on the comments, it says by the reviewers, that they are this is a frank account uh, given by a leading surgeon that has both good and bad news for the, for the patients. I'd say uh, to my colleagues to have a little read about this as well. Um, in 2017, the ESC and EX um, published their guidelines for the valvular heart disease in which they said the Euroscore um, overestimated um, the score, the risk as well as it had a, the calibration was poor, so it should not be used, but instead the Euroscore 2 and the STS are more accurate. Um, but having said that, they do have their limitation as well. And that, these limitations are from the insufficient disease severity, the patient frailty is not taken to, into account, the porcelainio type patient has got obviously is a high risk condition, it's not taken into account. And similarly, you know, the patient who had a previous radiation, so for example, patient following breast cancer, a mastectomy, uh, for any you know, other reason had the radiotherapy. And when you go in, you know, your most important graft in, in, in coronary surgery is the lima, and harvesting a lima in a patient post radiation is, is a bit of a challenge. And these models, they don't take into account. The TAVI is a new thing, um, not new, has been there for a while, but it is, you know, coming as a competitive to the aortic valve replacement by surgery. And they have their own model of risk stratification as well. And the France 2 risk score can be used to predict the early mortality following um, the TAVI and the TVT registry um, have been used to develop a predicted model of in-hospital mortality after the uh, transcatheter aortic valve replacement. This model uh, should be a valuable adjunct for patient counseling, local quality improvement, and monitoring the TAVR patients uh, in your clinical practice. Now, I have put this slide here um, uh, for my relatively more junior colleagues um, that how do we develop these guidelines? And these guidelines are generally developed from um, the evidence. So the, the, the class of recommendation really depends on to the level of evidence available. And when this changes, then that changes. What I mean is when evidence changes, and the recommendation changes. And that's why this is a frequently reoccurring phenomena, okay? And there are numerous trials running and the technology is always evolving. And uh, one of the thing, you know, when we discuss about the robotic surgery, then I always say, you know, technology is there and it is always there to evolve only. It's not gonna go back. It's only gonna evolve, okay? So the, these, the technology as well as these trials um, will make something which is valid now, they may invalidate it in the near future or in the distant future. So this is how we should um, uh, look at it. And um, if I show you my next slide, so it, it is not the future. I labeled it as the future, but basically these are our published guidelines, but we're, I'm gonna make a, extraction from these guidelines. Now, aortic valve used to be the gold standard treatment like the cabbage for the uh, ischemic heart disease in, in selected patients and then the TAVI came. The initially, when the TAVI came, it came for high risk, very high risk or pro prohibitive surgical risk patients. But whatever the evidence is, I'm not saying, you know, there has been recently debates about some randomized controlled trial for, especially for ischemic heart disease. But what I'm saying is whatever the 
or whatever sort of evidence it has been there, you know, whether it is um, industry influence or whether it is proper accurate data, the TAVI has come into practice and it has made its way from prohibitive surgical risk to intermediate risk, okay? And this has come into your own guidelines, our own surgical guidelines that TAVR is class one indication for prohibitive uh, surgical risk patients and high risk patients along with the, uh, with the uh, surgical aortic valve replacement. Although for intermediate risk, it remains as class two, the surgical aortic valve replacement is class one for intermediate risk as well as for the low risk, but who knows, who can predict the future? And that's why it is very, very important to have the very, very good surgical uh, results and all the, uh, not just the perioperative mortality, but the long-term results um, um, so that we, we, we can show the comparative or uh, better data as well as the quality of life. Now, this was uh, all related uh, with the, uh, so far with the thoracic, uh, the cardiac surgery. Um, now I'm gonna move on to uh, slightly, uh, the thoracic, but it's a slightly different way of uh, risk stratification into the uh, thoracic side. Um, Dr. Khan, is it okay? Or should we have uh, any questions here? Or should I carry on moving? No, no, just carry on. Now you're doing really well. Uh, let's finish all the whole talk and then we will have a discussion. Okay. Okay, that's fine. So for the thoracic surgery, um, we do have the uh, risk assessment system and the three main things which we measure in the risk stratification of thoracic is the risk of uh, mortality, the perioperative mortality, and the risk of post-op cardiac event, which usually is in the, in the perioperative period. And the third thing, um, uh, another very important thing is the long-term effect of the shortness of breath because you are going to take somebody's um, lung out because this model has been developed primarily for lung reception for lung cancer. So you're gonna take someone's lung out. So you need to look at the quality of life following this. So if I look on to the each bits of these, as you can see on my slide, to calculate the cardiac event you you have the uh, American College guidelines or AHA risk stratification. For the uh, mortality calculation, we also have um, a similar model um, uh, which gives us um, mortality like in cardiac Euroscore, we have the TRICO score, which I'm gonna discuss in the next slide. And also there is a system of calculating long-term shortness of breath or dyspnea, which is based on um, the, the lung, functions and we predict the post-op uh, functioning. So this assessment then categorizes these patients to either um, uh, low risk or high risk for surgery. And obviously high risk does not mean that you're excluding them from surgery, but it gives you an opportunity to individualize the treatment, discuss these cases in your MDT and discuss these facts with the patient and the family so that they can make an informed decision. And you can discuss with these patients as a, you know, as a family, um, because the whole purpose of uh, you is to make the patient better. And that's what their family wants. So we are like the family members because we are looking after them. And this model of assessing these thoracic patients is called the tripartite um, risk assessment model, okay? Which includes three, three things, okay? Now, the, the cardiac event is calculated by the cardiac risk index. And the cardiac risk index take into account the uh, unstable coronary artery um, syndrome, the heart failure, or any arrhythmias, any sort of arrhythmias. They could be heart block, they could be AV block, they could be, you know, uh, bradycardia, tachycardia. And also it includes the uh, severe uh, heart valve disease as well. So in these patients, um, you really need to get the cardiology opinion and um, see what their suggestions are, especially if the patient has got unstable or severe angina or had MI in the 
in the in the recent days and he has been incidentally during that worker found to have lung cancer what to do we need to have a discussion with the with the cardiologic leads or if the patient um has been found to have decompensated heart failure or he has got same as i said before arrhythmias so we really need to seek our cardiology guys uh, opinion and their recommendation and we also need to assess them so these these are the past medical history but then there is a clinical assessment which is based on uh, your clinical examination as well as some further investigations and that would include uh, various um, assessments that in you know that is simple walking simple talking to specified tests like pulmonary function test or cpex testing these uh, patients um um and nowadays we we give these patients um an estimate of cardiac um event by using a revised model which is called the revised cardiac index um the revised cardiac index uh, i was going to put into the um picture here i think i've only forgotten uh, you can again like the uh, euroscore you can online there is a calculator available you can put the information in and it gives you the risk uh, of the cardiac event happening in the perioperative period and on that basis a revised cardiac index model has been developed uh, which gives you a 30 day mortality or the um, the chances of mi um, in that period so if when you put these risk factors in which which i discussed before which uh, include not only the heart failure and the, the angina but also include the patient status of diabetes or any tia as well as the uh, creatinine clearance so when you take into account if the patient has no risk factor it gives a mortality uh, not the mortality the revised cardiac index of um, 0.4% which is basically reflects the mortality one factor to 1 1% easy to remember for you guys one factor 1% mortality two factors seven if it is more than three factors it gives a mortality of about um, uh, 11% which is quite significantly high but at least it gives you help in decision making now so that was the cardiac risk index yeah now we come on to the calculation of the mortality in patients who are coming for um, um, uh, thoracic surgery more specifically the lung res resection especially for the malignant cases so the thrac score was developed by the french society of thoracic and cardiovascular surgery it um has been very widely actually had more than any other studies patients included because it was studied for over 15000 patients and it is one of the largest uh, available models and it has a c index which is the concordance index which gives us the um validation of this data set that if the the, the index mostly remains within the point eight six percent and you know if it if the c index stays between 0.7 to 1 the validity of the data set is usually higher so thrac score has got some good implications there are other risk models available as well in addition to the thrac score for calculating the mortality and these include the the ests model which was um, developed um, on patients um, data which is over 3000 and similarly uh, wet run affair model which again has uh, over 3000 patients uh, in that study the thrac score has got an online calculator available as well and uh, if you put these variables which include the patient age and the sex the dyspnea score um, and the asa score and, and the performance status of the patient and the priority of the surgery was an elective and urgent and the diagnosis group it gives a different points for the benign and the malignant group and the procedure class the procedure class if you are doing it for laminectomy or doing it for um, any other procedure whether it is lobectomy or sublingectomy and in addition any comorbidities which are uh, in this patient if you add these factors 
it gives you um, an estimated mortality. So moving on to the third segment of the risk stratification in threat separation. So we have discussed mortality, we've discussed calculation and the uh, how to look into the cardiac risk index. The third is the long-term uh, dyspnea or long-term shortness of um, breath in these patients. Um, now, we, we have uh, a system with, of calculating this but if the patient generally have low risk of post-op dyspnea, this is an indication for surgery. Or it means that you could consider or you could offer this patient a lung resection or thoracic surgery. Um, that is based on to that if he has got um, the predicted post-op FEV1 as well as the TLCO, 40% or more. Okay, so you are generally safe to proceed for this. The moderate to high risk are those patients who have the post-op FEV1 or the TLCO less than that. And for those group of patients, as I said before, surgery is not a straightforward contraindication. You just need to make further assessment. And that further assessment would include your clinical judgment, which will be based on to the um, the patient's um, performance status, as well as through special investigations, which will include putting them through stair climbing tests, shuttle walk test, or doing the CPEX. Now here, if, um, if I can show you how you, how you calculate the predicted post-op, um, FEV1, I think um, that is not really the purpose of um, uh, this talk. Um, so that's why I will just say that, you know, I'll just tell you the number, which is the, you know, anyone who has got um, between 40 to 60% is reasonably good enough candidate to proceed to surgery because he will be a low risk. But anyone who has got um, less than 40% then need further testing. And now that for the testing, as I said before, you can either, you know, walk the patient with yourself in the clinic. It will be obvious when he will be coming to your, you know, will, when he will walk into your office. Or sometimes I, I have practically when I didn't um, have in some centers, we didn't have the CPACs available. I've actually taken the patients onto the stairs and make a clinical judgment from there. But if for the exam purposes, there will be some students who are sitting here who may be appearing for the FRCS exam. So they need to know the numbers because that's what the examiner will ask you. And the number for, for this is so if, if, if your patient is able to walk uh, six, uh, sorry, 400 uh, meters or more is reasonable. Four, uh, the actual figure is 450, but you know, is variable between 400 to 450 is re reasonable for shuttle walk test, okay? Or if the stair climbing is less than 22 meters, then he goes into the other category, you know, that you need to do further testing because he, he goes into moderate or high risk. And uh, in these patients, what you need to do, you need to do, some people call it as CPET, or some people call it as CPEX, is cardiopulmonary exercise test, um, which is in, in the special center, it is very widely used, but I'm aware of the fact that it is not um, easily available everywhere either. But CPEX does help you in terms of uh, regrouping these patients after further assessment, whether they have got cardiac, um, primarily cardiac problem or the lung problem that will be prohibited for their surgery or will they be okay to proceed. And that gives you the VOT max uh, for calculation of these patients. So generally for the trainees to remember, if these patients have got a VOT max on their CPEX test, after they have been in a borderline lung function, um, more than 20 mil uh, per kilogram per minute of VO2 max is regarded as good. So you can proceed with the surgery, yeah. If these patients have uh, between 10 to 20%, these are categorized as moderate risk patients. But if this patient has got uh, the predicted uh, uh, FIO2 and TLCO less than 40%, you have done CPACs, 
which has shown you the you know, VO2 max of less than 10 mil per kilogram per minute, then you are really, really, uh, you know, um, careful. You have to be very careful in all, um, uh, offering surgery to this kind of patient because their quality of life uh, is not presumed to be good following the surgery. Okay. And then obviously you, you, there are certain other things which in, based on your experience, based on how you operate, based on what the, what the underlying disease is. Say for example, when you're doing lung surgery for a patient who has got newly diagnosed lung cancer, which is early stage in the apex of the upper lobe and he's got upper lobe predominant emphysema. Say for example, so these, these are the things which you combine, combine with these investigations and then make your judgment after discussing uh, these patients in the MDT and bringing these uh, facts to the attention of your patient as well. Okay. Now, uh, I, I, ideally, these two things, they don't come into the risk stratification. Uh, I think this is the way how you calculate patients' um, risk of being a lesion malignant is not relevant to this, to this talk. So th that's uh, all from me and to the audience and uh, to Mr. Khan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asghar. Uh, it was uh, really interesting to have a talk on cardiac and thoracic surgery in the same sitting because it really gives us a perspective of, of all the available modalities to a surgeon. So I'm going to start the q and uh, I will uh, be the student uh, at this end and I will ask you questions as if I am a year one student. Uh, somebody's phone is uh, making uh, noise. Can you just mute it, please? Yeah, okay. All right. So, uh, you know, Askar, you told us all these, uh, you know, first we talk about the cardiac side of things. So you told us about so many uh, types of uh, scoring systems, starting from Parsonets to Euroscores to modified Euroscores to the STS database. Uh, if I am a new uh, trainee or a new surgeon sitting in my clinic, and I have uh, Mr. John walk into my clinic, uh, what should I use? Give me practical uh, tips on what should I use to assess a patient. He's got angina, he's going to go for CABG. What should I use in my clinic to assess this patient? Okay. So the, all the, as I said, the basics come first and that basics include the clinical uh, judgment first, which will include the history and examination of the patient, and that will be supplemented with the clinical investigation. And for a person who is relatively new into the speciality, we need to keep things simple. And as, as, I, as I said, the simple things, the Euroscore is something which is most commonly used, and it is relatively easily calculatable if if you know what the patient-related factors, operator-related factors are, you will be there and then, even from your mind calculation, be able to give a judgment or make your own judgment and then discuss with the patient. And uh, nowadays, I think it is um, the, um, it is uh, uh, not difficult for everyone, all the cardiothoracic trainees, at least whoever I have seen, they have got apps on their mobile phone and they calculate the, the you know, your score um, very quickly and within seconds. So I would say just use, you know, keep one model because it will be easy. You won't be getting confused because you will be using day in, day out in your practice and you could imply quickly. So, you know, it depends whatever you prefer, but I always use the Euroscore. It's easier, it's quicker, and it gives you a one negative model as well. Okay, so, so Euroscore is a good model and you're happy with it. Do you think Euroscore is uh, adequately powered to answer questions across uh, racial populations and across various countries? Because somebody from here is from far, uh, far East, somebody's from Middle East, somebody's from uh, Europe. So is Euroscore adequately powered to answer a question, for, uh, to uh, give us a score in, a patient, in an Indian patient, for example? Yeah. Yeah, very, very good question. As, and as I said before, no, the, the straight answer is no, because it doesn't take into account the racial considerations. And also when, when, when we say um, age, the, even if we look at the age, the age for a patient who is 60 year old, or let's say 65 year old, 
a patient who is born and bred white patient in UK or in US is different from a 65 year old patient in India or Pakistan or in you know, that part of the world. So I would say even the, the first, the Euroscore doesn't take into account the, uh, the, the racial concentration. Secondly, I think it also the 65 year old Indian or 65 year old American is a different patient. So this, this will help in making judgment, but it doesn't mean that it is gonna be accurately employed into that uh, population. So, so we're back to the square one. Uh, if we have uh, an international practice, say somebody like me who, who practices in Asia and practices in Europe, uh, what should I use? I'm sorry, I'm putting you on the spot, <laughs> but I, I'm speaking on behalf of the students because I don't yeah. want the students to walk away from here being yeah. confused. I want them to be convinced of what is the correct answer for them and yeah. what is the correct answer for the FRCS exam as well. Yeah, I think in this in this situation, my, my version uh, saying would be that I would still use these scores because they help you uh, guide the management but they will not be the accurate predictor of mortality, but they will be still valid because they, having said that, you know, they have not been cal have calculated on the uh, racial basis, but having said that they have been validated following, following on into different populations. So, so I would still use them, but maybe sure. there is a time for, it, it is something for us, you know, say for example, from in people from Asian countries to develop uh, a new South Asian model, say for example, our Asian score, okay. say for example. Okay. Um, so at this stage, I'm going to bring in Kamran and I'm gonna take Kamran's opinion on this as well. Kamran, the question is, if there is a young student who works, uh, you know, in Pakistan, India, uh, what should he use in his clinic? Here's a guy, 65 year old with angina. I think, basically, thank you, uh, Oscar. Very good presentation, and uh, it was a, a pleasure listening to that. Now, I think, as I said um, at the outset, I liked a very practical approach, and we need something. You know, there's a lot of history here. Let me just see my mic. There's a lot of history, different systems. What we use has to be user friendly and accessible. And one of the slides mm -hmm. Oscar showed, which was the all the scoring systems, the one of the, the key factors was how many variables. And if we look at the, the Euroscore um, 2, that basically has maybe 18, 19 variables, whereas the STS has almost 50. And that is a very key determinant. The Euroscore 2 is quite accessible. What I do on my phone, I've got this app and I just use the Euroscore 2 app, which is very easy to put in. So, within about 20 seconds, you can have all the output, the patient age, male, female, creatinine, the patient factors, and what within, it's much easier to get the number, whereas to enter in STS, it's not as accessible. I think for the FRCS exam, the Euroscore 2 is the one that one would use. In previous times, in the multiple choice exam, it was very common that they would give you a scenario, this is Mr. So-and-so, he's 76, he's got, um, coronary artery disease, referred for CABG, poor LV, he's got COPD, renal failure, and they would ask you to work out the Euroscore, there'd be five options, and you have to do it in your head. Now we don't use the additive Euroscore, but we used to have at least 10, 20 questions in our exam, which were Euroscore. Probably you remember, sure. Zamir, when you did the exam. Now yes, of it's, I it's a logistic and it's Euroscore too, so I would use that one. Now, as, as well as knowing the scoring system, I think what's really critical, especially when you study for exam, and discussing individual patients is know what the definitions are. And the slide Oscar showed is for every single patient factor, for instance, what is chronic pulmonary disease? Many patients think that they've got asthma or COPD, but know the definitions. For instance, it will say long-term use of bronchodilators or steroids. Some patients may have had asthma in their childhood, but they admit it's not, it doesn't qualify. Or for instance, what is peripheral arteriopathy? Previously used to have patients who had previous neurological dysfunction. Similarly here, that's the next step. So know the criteria if they've had previous intervention, if they've got more than 50% stenosis. Um, and then the term critical perioperative state, that has many different 
uh, meaning so for people, it doesn't mean the patient's just in ICU, it means the patient's had a pre-op cardiac arrest, they've been intubated, ventilated, they've got renal failure needing renal replacement therapy, they have an infrared balloon pump or they've had a VT. And then similarly, the specifics in terms of what is pulmonary hypertension, it's defined in this one as more than 60. Um, and I think that knowing all the individual factors is, is quite important. Euroscore 2 is very useful. The limitation, it's based on a European population. No one's done any sort of cross-sectional work in Asia, North Africa. I think there's so much diversity. We know from a personal you know, experience when we operate on patients, we have different, especially when you work in a place like London, very cosmopolitan, you see a whole diversity of races. Ethnicity doesn't come into this, but we know just from empirical evidence is that certain, you know, certain populations have different nature of coronary disease. And coronary artery, CABG is one of the most studied operations. It's one of the lowest risk operations. Mortality for first time CABG is less than 1% um, in the UK. And most patients who do Euroscore will be 0.5%. However, if you have someone with very diffuse disease, very uh, poor targets, that can change your whole outcomes, but it's not reflected in this. So we should okay. um, use it with caution, but I think as a practical level, Euroscore 2 is very applicable because the SDS score may be based on larger database and it has probably very good, it doesn't overestimate on, unlike the Euroscore 1 and 2 used to, but it's probably not as user-friendly. There's 49 data fields. You won't have all of those fields to hand necessarily. So, so let me just clarify for the young students that Euroscore 2 is a good score to use. I'd like to bring in uh, Professor Abid Jilani, who is currently Professor of Cardiothoracic Surgery in India. Professor Jilani, if you, if you can hear me, could you switch on your microphone? And I want you to give us a Southeast Asian perspective. What do you use in your everyday practice when you sit with a patient uh, who's got uh, coronary artery disease? Professor Jilani, uh, I, I hope you're, yeah, you're still with us. Can you switch on your microphone? Hello? I think uh, we may not have Professor Jilani. Okay, so that's, that's one. So that's a good answer for I, young students is that Euroscore 2 is a good one. Amongst the apps, which is the easiest to use? So I, I would basically just Euroscore 2 app. There's one app which just has Euroscore okay. 2 on there. Yeah. So um, that, that's, that's a good app to have on your uh, That's the phone? one to have. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Two, uh, is a very good and easily uh, is, is a uh, is a user friendly as well. But at the same time, the people who are appearing for the exam, they need to you know the, even the examiner as an experienced examiner because you yourself might be going for the exams as well when when you assess these patients. What we want them is to be able to say that this is a low risk patient, this is a high risk patient, which will be available. So if they know the high risk criteria, say for example, patient has got a you know a patient is coming for surgery for ischemic heart disease, as you said, and he has got post-infarct VSD, he's got renal failure, and uh, he has, you know, age more than 65, and he is diabetic, then that gives you, you know, you should be able, okay. because knowing that, you know, there are certain scores which have got higher sure. points, you should be able to sure. calculate in your mind like this. On the other hand, okay. electively coming young patient who has got no comorbidities, then you should be able. The borderline is always discussion level. Sure, sure. Okay, so uh, I, I'm going to ask Vikas to switch on his microphone. Dr. Kesri, who's a senior consultant in cardiothoracic surgery uh, in Delhi. Uh, Vikas, what do you yes, use in your practice? Uh, and and what, uh, amongst all these scores, what do you use for the cardiac surgery patient? We regularly use Euroscore 2. Euroscore 2. Okay, so, yeah. so it is quite applicable across uh, various yes. components and, and that's acceptable. Now, my next question is back to Asghar. Asghar, tell us, uh, what is the medical legal importance of these scores? So can I defend myself in court if I operated on a patient and then I say I use the evaluation on the basis of Euroscore 2? What is the medical legal situation of this? Yeah, another very, uh, um, you know, important point and, and, and good question. And this, in, uh, I don't know how many medical legal 
cases we get in an Asian part of the world because my following graduation, my clinical practice has been minimal, but I, we know that in Western it's, world, this has a really strong implication. And that could no, be- No, heart surgery, uh, as got a heart surgery has become increasingly litigious because most of the heart surgery has gone into the private sector. And so everybody's worried about uh, medical legal cases. So go ahead, please. Yeah. So the, this, the knowledge of this risk stratification could be used for, first of all, you know, as we said, the, in, uh, in the process of generating an informed consent. Okay, when you have discussed with the patient and their next of kin or the family member, on one side, and also make sure that, you know, this is you know, the, the, the cardiothoracic surgery is a very complex surgery and we have competitive in the market as well. So patient, patient relatives is one side and the multidisciplinary team, whatever you call it, we call it MDM in, here in uh, Ireland, we call MDT in the UK, you know, you call heart team, you know, and uh, you probably have different name in India. So you have your colleagues, consensus as the, on that as well, especially for borderline and high risk patients. So these risk score, if God forbid things go wrong, or if the patient intentionally takes you to the coach, then you have, you know, the, the something to back you up that based on your current knowledge and expertise and the evidence, we made this decision, not only we made this decision, we made this decision in agreement with the patient. And that's where the informed consent will come into, come into um, practice. So a, I'm not saying that you should become a risk averse, but at the same time, this can back you up in the medical legal situation. Okay, so this, is, this will hold up in court if you use the statement that we used Euroscore to calculate the risk. Yeah, now, because uh, what we are the, doing the, in practice is, sorry, is, is what is in patient's best interest. So we so do have a moral responsibility to explain to the patient and help them make the decision. So, and, and you know, and if, if then you have to end up unfortunately in court, then, you know, you have some backup. So, so the other important point which you made, which I want to elaborate for our youngsters is the, which is a practice in the UK and uh, in Ireland and in most of Europe, which unfortunately is not there in Southeast Asia, is that every single patient that you operate on goes through the MDT and the MDT meetings uh, are documented, they are minuted. So there is a documentation that this patient has uh, you know been discussed amongst cardiologists and surgeons and the best interest decision for the patient was taken so in the exam if you're ever asked this question you must mention the use of mdt for decision making of surgery for a patient that's the first answer that should come and that is what i expect from a candidate because my main purpose of an examination is not to examine the depth of your knowledge. My main purpose of examining you is to make sure that you are a safe surgeon. If I'm going to make you into an FRCS qualified consultant surgeon, then I want to make sure I'm not letting you lose on the general person and you do not, you know, you cannot make a rational decision. So safety is the most important thing. So always, always, whenever you back up your answer, the first statement should always be that I have taken, you know, more than one view. Uh, and, and this is a multidisciplinary team view. The same thing, if a question ever comes to you in the examination about a complication, any complication in surgery, the first answer in all of this should be, I will call for help. Because no matter how senior, even at my level, if I have a problem, I always make sure that somebody else walks into the theater. Because when I'm involved in a complication, my focus is different. And a new pair of eyes will put a different perspective to the situation. So call for help and call for colleagues' help is extremely important. Now, next question to you, Asghari, is that uh, do you actually document this in your notes that I used Euroscore? And number two, do you actually document it in your consent form? 
Uh, yes. So for um, for my junior colleagues, so the consent on generally should include at least three things. And the three things that you need to give an elaboration of the diagnosis to the patient. And you need to tell them the uh, available options. Okay. So if the patient has come to you with ischemic heart disease, don't just discuss only the cabbage because there are other options available. And for, you know, although you have risk scoring model and other models to guide your treatment, uh, or, or the management or the choice of a procedure or the intervention, but these are only the guides. They do not give you every, each and every individual patient. So individual patient is a different patient. So always use them to individualize your treatment for those particular patients. So consent should include elaboration of the diagnosis and the options available for that particular patient and the benefits and risks. Now, you may not be capable to discuss each and everything with the patient in terms of if you don't do TAVI, you, you may not be able to discuss, but you maybe say that alternative is available and you should be able to give the details of your own procedure and be able to offer them an opinion if the patient wishes to for a suitable alternative, say for example, for ischemic heart disease, either the stents or for whether the heart disease, the TAVI or mitral clap, whatever. Then the risks and complications. Now, mortality is one thing. So you tell the mortality, you also tell the, the other significant um, uh, complications and frequently recurring complications. They make part of the consent. So, and then you ask patient if they want time to think about it, are they, if they are able to give the decision. So, and these, all these information should be documented in the notes. In my clinical practice, because you asked me what I do, in my clinical practice, when I see the patient, I document in the notes, you know, and nowadays we, we dictate the clinical, uh, clinic letter. So there is a documentation by hand and there is a detailed clinical letter which has been dictated and comes with print. And then after that, we have a consent. So the consent also has detail of all these components which I have described. And this consent paper is kept as part of the patient uh, record, whether it is electronic, whether it is paper record. So you have referral letter to you. You have, uh, if you have discussed this case in the MDT, you have MDT document uh, outcome uh, documented there. You have your own clinic notes. You have your dictated clinic letter and you have the consent where you have, you know. So that way- So, so Oscar, just for clarity, actually in the consent, is the Euroscore mentioned? In the consent, um, in the con in our consent form, the it is not mentioned. But part of the routine practice, which I've seen with other colleagues as well, there is estimated mortality given, which is based on the Euroscore. So okay. we we say the Euroscore in the clinic letter, but because the consent letter could have sorry the consent form could have limited things. So you will write okay. say for example, uh, cabbage you know mortality one percent, risk of stroke okay. this many percent. Um, or lobectomy, say for example, one percent mortality. So it doesn't okay. say the. So it patient, doesn't. So it doesn't mention the type of scoring system you use, but yeah. but there is a mention of the percentage mention, yes. uh, that you have quoted to the patient. Yes. Kamran, yes. would you like to come in? You you can we have yeah. your comments on this question? So sure. with regards to so consent. Think, exactly. So I I think actually consent. I, I do a lot of teaching. Consent is a whole, we should have a whole talk on this because yeah, sure. it, this is a, when you have the, ex, if you do the part to uh, cardiothoracic part two exam, consent can be one of the patient encounters. So they can give you a scenario. Here is Mr. So-and-so, please consent them for a lobectomy. Please consent for ABR. And everyone in different regions will do it in a different way. But one of the things that this particular topic, what risk stratification and scoring system, this is not an issue of a, of basic science is not operative. This comes under the whole domain of professionalism. And so even though we are working in different areas, what we, what the FRCS and the, good, the, the General Medical Council, these themes should be universal. We all want to be professionals and we rely upon these basic concepts of good care 
and professionalism, one of the key things is being um, open, being transparent. And that's where when you do the consent, you have to be open, transparent, and you have to explain, as Oscar said, but specifically when it comes to risks, I, you have to put the, the most obvious risks and people will now quote different. So you can quote, for instance, you can quote maybe the published risk. So you could say the risk of mortality from CABG, AVR, this is what the literature quotes. Or you can quote maybe your individual risk, looking at your own personal data. If you've done lots of operations, you will quote the patient your own. I think that's probably the best estimate you can give. You can quote the patient this so and so. Um, or you can quote the unit, unit, for instance, mortality. If you have a patient, if you're doing a dissection, for instance, or a post infarct VSD, those numbers you may not have done very many, or you may have done some and your mortality may be too high to quote. So I think you have to tailor it. The ideal thing is that you quote, uh, you use the Euroscore as something to support you. So one of the, in medical legal cases, there have been cases, individuals, or when units, certain uh, institutions, when they've been investigated and there's been external uh, investigations by or college surgeons or so forth, whenever they investigate units, they look at everything and they look at all the documentation. And one of the key things is when you're quoting risk, who has done the consent form? It used to be when Zamir used to work at Harefield Hospital, on a Sunday, there would be 20 patients on the list. The SHO would consent all the patients. If that was the culture, the most junior person who's never even seen the operation, never done the operation, would just go and get the form signed. Now there's a medical legal requirement that if you're doing a consent, you have to be able to perform the operation yourself. Uh, it doesn't have to be the consultant, but in my personal practice, because I like to consent all the patients. I like to, if I see the patient in the outpatient clinic, I will go through everything. And I think this idea is a good way to practice when you see the patient in clinic, go through the consent. And when you dictate your letter, if in your letter you say, I explained principal indications, I've gone through the risks and benefits and you put the risks in there. Consent is not just a piece of paper that you find in the notes. Consent actually is a whole active process. And for consent to have taken place, firstly, you need some evidence. And if you have it in your letter, you can say there's been an encounter between you and the patient. You've documented what you said and you document the patient's response. Has the patient agreed to consent? Are they willing to proceed? So when you consent someone, it's you have to decide are you gonna use your personal data but having Euroscore 2 there, I use that so when I had to quote, a, I had to add a patient on yesterday I quote upon, he was an extreme risk patient who came in in cardiogenic shock, critical aortic stenosis. He had a poor, very poor LV. He was in multi-organ failure. This patient is almost prohibitive risk. It, it, it's, it's something which you have very little experience of. I put the numbers into the Euroscore 2 because I have to quote some sort of risk. And the Euroscore 2 came out as 30%, which is extremely high. And so at least I, and I said this, I said to the patient, it's extremely high risk. And I put Euroscore 2, 30%. So people know what sort of ballpark okay. you're in if you Euroscore 2. So that's an important factor. And I think what's also this covers is, is a lot of this is about what is a mere point is, is about judgment. So what they want to assess in the exam is your judgment and you're using risk stratification to guide your judgment because there are extremes of operations. That's for the book that um, I was going to mention, Naked Surgeon Sam Neshev. He did a survey in Papworth in there and they looked at a range of their 15 surgeons or so and they categorized them to people who are very risk averse, very cautious, to those who are, they, you know, cowboys. They, he used the term cowboys, people who uh, like to take risk. And when he looked at the diff two different extremes of surgeons, you would think that the ones who are the cowboys, high risk, their mortality would be worse, but actually it was the same. So there are different behaviors of surgeons but ultimately what we want, they don't want to see you as a cowboy when you come to present the exam. They want you to be sensible, safe, measured, and show good judgment. And when we speak to our colleagues, someone like Zamir, who's got a lot more surgical wisdom, my, some of my colleagues have said to me, you spend the first five to 10 years learning how to operate. Then you spend the next 10 years maybe learning uh, when to operate. And then you spend the last decade learning when not to operate. Um, or they say the good surgeon knows how to operate, the better one knows when and the best surgeon knows when not to operate. And this is where this comes in. These are tools that you use along with clinical judgment to guide you know, when to operate and to give the patient the best care. So to summarize for the students, it is a good practice to document which score you have used, what was the calculated score, and it's also good practice to mention it on the consent form. 
There's nothing to stop you when you say the, the risks of the operations are mortality 2%. You can add a word there according to Euroscore. That's absolutely all right. And it will be accepted by any hospital and any lawyer. I mean, I, 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 I talk to, because I, I do personally, I do medical legal practice and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Ministry of Justice certified person for medical legal practice, I, I can tell you that the one thing that most solicitors have a problem with is lack of information, not extra information. If you put extra information, they never have a problem with it. Their problem is lack of information on the consent form. So please, uh, it's a very important point with both Kamran and Asghar have made that you use the app to calculate the score, but do not forget to document it in the notes because what is not documented has never happened. That is what it is in a court of law. So do not forget to document in the notes. That's why I'm asking him this specific question to highlight to the students that you can use as many apps as you like, but if you do not document, it has never happened, okay? So let's get it clear. Please put it in your clinical notes, put it in your consent form. Both are very important. Now, my next question to you, Asgar, is if you're using these scores and you're sitting in a clinic with different patients coming through the door, so the first one needed CABG, the second one needed MVR, the third one needed AVR, the fourth one had mixed valve disease. Can I use the same score for all of them or should I use different scores for different diseases? So gen in general term, actually, if we say this, Euroscore could potentially be used for all these conditions because it would still be, it still takes it into account. Although it doesn't specifically categorize something else, but it does say, you know, whether you're doing surgery for ischemic heart disease or you're doing surgery for valve or you're doing surgery for thoracic aorta. So it just does take into account. So, but you know, in practice, you want something simpler to use, something that you can discuss easily with the patient and adopt as, uh, as your routine. So it, it does take into account um, uh, uh, all conditions uh, and then you have okay. to individualize the treatment. So, so it's okay to use just it's one okay score for different disease patterns. Is that your yeah. practice, Cameron? So Would you uh, use the same score so for all for patients? Routine, this Euroscore is validated across the board and it's so it ranges from all cardiac surgery and it has specific fields in terms of one procedure, two procedure, three. It doesn't it doesn't actually ask you in, in the Euroscore, it won't you won't be able to say this is a mitral valve or an aortic valve. It just basically, it doesn't have specific specificity such as that. So that's one of the limitations, but what's now becoming more apparent, now we have disease specific scoring systems. And actually okay. some of these have been used in validated database. So one, of, for, for instance, there's now uh, an infective endocarditis scoring system from the STS, which was devised by one of my colleagues at Duke, Jeff Gaser. So with that, you can put in specific disease parameters and get an individual score because within this, it does, you do get points for active endocarditis, but it, there are some which are maybe a bit more accurate. And then in terms of aortic dissection, for instance, that is a, a, a field where actually there is a lot of variability because it depends on the presentation of the patient. So there's a, there's a scoring system from University of Pennsylvania, the Penn score, and what that looks at it, you've got aortic dissection but then it subcategorizes the degree of malperfusion so if you have one organ two organ three organ malperfusion you can then estimate the score because otherwise we will we could put the euro score two in it may say that the mortality is 20 percent, but it may not be able to give you the same degree of specificity and similarly when you look at the published literature if you look at the the, the I, international registry of aortic dissection the irad registry may give you a 25 percent mortality for aortic dissection but specific to that scenario when you've got organ malperfusion the mortality can be 70 80 percent so i think these are things that are evolving euroscore 2 is a very practical thing as you become more experienced you can then often use your own practice that's what you'll use to categorize patients yours is used as a judgment more so in in the era now where we decide where there are more than one therapy previously cardiac surgery was only open surgery now, as guidelines evolve, and now we're having patients coming for 
Tavi, they're using the Euroscore 2 and the STS to try to, to use that as a gate, as a, as a way of um, deciding which patients are referred for Tavi, which patients are referred for surgery. So that is another reason why it's important when you're assessing patients to have the scoring system to hand, because if the Euroscore 2 is prohibitive, then they, you've got a good rationale to send them for the Tavi. Okay, now, now just coming back to this situation of an individual versus institution. So uh, I, I, there's a lot to talk on that, but my first question to you as there would be, if, if I am a person sitting in my private practice, I'm a new you know, year one or year two surgeon and, and, and the world is extremely competitive out there. Um, and uh, you know, if I quote, if, if I calculate the Euro score and the number comes up slightly higher, uh, and if I quote that number to the patient, it is likely that the patient will go down the corridor to the next guy who's offering CABG at a 1% mortality as compared to a CABG was for a 3% mortality. I, I just want you to comment on this and the importance of why you should actually tell the truth to the patient. Uh, Asghar, please take this and then I'll come to you, Kamran, in a minute. Yeah, so the if you have the accurate information about the patient. And if you have used whichever score you used, this wouldn't change the scoring. Although, you know, the, some other person may say, I will quote your mortality of say, for example, 1%. And when you have calculated your mortality, you calculate the mortality of 2% and you said 2% to the patient. A patient is a little bit confused. It's difficult for him because apparently when you look from the patient size, if you put yourself into patient shoes, he will say, well, you know, this surgeon is probably more um, competent or better surgeon. You know, I, I, I should be going to him. But the scoring if would not be different. The score will be the same. You know, if you have put this in, if, if you have used Euroscore 2, say, for example, for the same patient, it should calculate the same. And now this is different than how you, how you give your own mortality. That is where the institutional practice comes. That's where the individual practice comes. And sometimes, uh, I mean, this is a good point, actually, to, to discuss is this point. A surgeon with a relatively high mortality may not always mean that he is a bad surgeon. And why would I say that? I would say that because that surgeon, you'll need to look into his actual practice. Now that actual practice could be, is he an experienced surgeon who is always doing high risk cases? You know, if it is like Mr. Big is operating always on aortic dissection, whenever he is in call, he is lucky to have these aortic dissections coming into him. Or if he is getting too many of, um, you know, uh, coronaries repairing um, um, uh, coronaries um, for left main stem or if he has got uh, ischemic mitral to repair, you know, these are complex cases. If his practice is based on this and if you calculate the individual practice of that patient, because if people do go on Google or they look onto the hospital practice onto your, uh, onto your website, hospital website, uh, but these analysis should be made uh, very carefully because a person, on the other hand, may be having a 1% mortality. But he may have done in one year only 10 operations, which would have been very straightforward, you know, simple cases where the mortality would have been expected as 0%, say, for example. So these things, they help you for judgment, but they are not there, the solid things. That's what I, what I would say about this. Okay, Kamran, your advice, yeah. uh, and I, I will can also I give advice I, I, to the youngsters. I just like to, can I share a I screen want... with you, you guys? I just please do, please do. Share this. Can, can you see this? To... Do you see this slide? Yeah. Uh, not as yet. Uh, we're still seeing Asghar's screen. So Asghar, you might can have you to- uh, Stop share. Stop share. Um, okay, let me see. Just go into share screen and stop share. At the bottom, the green button will say stop share. Yeah, I think I need to first go into the full screen. Yeah, you, you will have to have the whole thing up. So you'll have to increase it. So, so while he's doing this, uh, le let, me, let me put you uh, 
let me give you my I can answer the question. Any words? Yeah, go ahead, Kamran. You you say first, and I'll I'll give them the synopsis in a minute. So I think what the the point is that uh, the ideally what you should you, you should quote your own you know in true what we call probity true transparency if if a patient comes to you you should quote them your own personalized results because you want to be you know reflect on what your outcomes are and for that specific procedure however what happens is the Euroscore to like the, all of them have their limitations and some surgeons they basically outperform the Euroscore and others they may not so so it can be sometimes your Euroscore your your actual results might be much better than the Euroscore um, so the, ideally you should present your own numbers because ultimately if you were to end up in a medical legal case what would happen is people would investigate they would look at what your outcomes are in the UK all surgeons mortality results are there to be seen they're transparent so you have a, a a web a portal where any patient can log on and what they'll see is not your individual specific case they'll see your mortality it's more actually what they look at is your survival so the survival percentage over a three-year period and so that is used as a benchmark and based upon your 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 risk stratified survival patient you have you, you are assessed and if you fall outside of that uh, if you're an outlier, then there may be reasons to investigate you. So basically, you should quote your own uh, results and you can use other references as guides if it's a procedure that is, is more limited or institutional. Because these days, we often work in a team. And one of the, the facts is that outcomes are not just down to the surgeon. It's often a team approach and there are many institutional factors that also play a role. We can see your screen come now. Good. So a year ago, uh, just so the last AATS, I was asked to give a, a, a talk. Actually, Professor Westerby is a consultant uh, retired from Oxford. He is very prolific. And he published this particular paper in the BMJ. And it was individual surgeons' death rates prompts risk averse behavior. And the reason why I wanted is just this cartoon that you see. So you see surgeon A, B, and C. This scenario he made was basically you can have three different surgeons. Surgeon A is a surgeon who's maybe a new surgeon. He's pretty careful in the cases that he selects and he's, he, he, he's got a 2% mortality. And this is, he's had two deaths and the deaths, can, death, as I said, can happen to different, they can happen due to a, a problem in the operating room. They can have a problem in the management, post-operating ME, or they, the fact that the patient had very high pre-op risk of a comorbidity. So he, he had two deaths due to surgical issues percent surgeon b has been taking on a lot of high risk cases he's also had a few patients that have had some post-op complications and then died as a result of managements maybe um, afterwards and that's often a term called failure to rescue so if a patient has a complication after surgery whether it's something such as even simple as an ammonia or a gi bleed or bowel ischemia if it's if, if you haven't been able to salvage that that's attributed to failure to rescue his mortality is five percent and then surgeon C is probably in the middle. He's he's had one surgical death and a couple of others. So what happens is you have this scenario where surgeon B now is going to become very risk averse because he knows he's already at five percent. That's his mortality. If patients see that, they're going to be a bit cautious. Cardiologists will be cautious, and even the people who manage hospitals and institutions. So this can lead to risk averse behavior. We did a study which looked at that, and there are many factors that attribute to that, partly due to the, the, the high risk nature of the, of the specialty, partly due to patient factors, other factors related to the governance and also the way patients are assessed. And one of the things that has come out from the work that has been done in look from, from Sam Nash, he describes in the book, now what's happened in order to avert or, or to reduce risk averse behavior, there's been um, something which has been introduced called dual consultant operating. So what happens is if a patient dies, it's rather than be attributed to an individual surgeon, that's your mortality. What they were doing at Papworth, they had something called the star chamber, whereby high-risk patients were assessed in a multidisciplinary team. It was deemed that these patients needed surgery, but we know the risks are high. Rather than deny them surgery and avoid them being a statistic if they were to die, if they, they, if they were operated in that institution, the mortality would then go 
to the institution as opposed to on your own results. Um, and so that system has now been implemented. So if, if you have a high risk case, it's discussed in an MDT, you have two surgeons who operate on that. And then the mortality is rather than individual surgeon, one or the other, it goes to the unit. So there are now mechanisms to mitigate risk averse behavior because ultimately we don't want to deny patients. We don't want to, to um, need to practice, which is very low risk as patients are getting more complex. So this is, these are all mechanisms that are being developed. Okay, so now let me put on yeah. my, my, my hat as a, as a senior surgeon and, and, and somebody who has been in private practice for the last 20 years or 25 years. Let me tell you what, what is the reality of the situation. Uh, it, this is uh, advice for all the youngsters who are just starting your practice. Let, you know, let, be very clear about it. The most important thing in clinical practice is patient safety. Okay, it is, there is no, no other alternative except to do what is safe for the patient in your hands. And you have to be very, very honest and very, very clear with the patient. No matter what is the risks involved, you have to actually quote the exact number that is there in these scores. You know, you work out the scores and you have to, and, and particularly when you get to my level, as he said, you learn when not to operate. And, and the biggest mistake that young surgeons do is they, in, in the desperation to get more cases, particularly in your private practice, you take on patients who are, you know, who are certainly high risk and uh, you have not quoted to them the correct risk. All patients are Googling these days and all your data is out there. I promise you all your data is out there either directly through your own practice or through the uh, institution's practice or through the society's practice. Wherever we are all as cardiothoracic surgeons, we are the most audited specialty and one way or the other, your data gets out there and people have access to your own figures. And so my advice to everybody would be that do not worry about losing one or two patients to a colleague down the road. Do not worry because in the long term, what will happen is your repetition will go up and a lot of practice is word of mouth. I promise you, it's all about word of mouth. When somebody has come to you, and you talk to him and he's gone down the road and he's taken a second opinion, people are very sensitive and they can very clearly understand who is telling the truth and who is not, who is trying to pull wool over their eyes. People are very, very sensitive to that. And my advice to you would be, it doesn't matter if you lose one or two or three cases. Uh, in, in the whole scheme of things, if you look at the total number of cases that you would do, in a year, it all evens out. So please, please, please do not make the mistake of understratifying the risk. Do not make this mistake. You need to land up in one trouble or in one bad case. And I promise you, medical legal things take over your life. If you have one bad case and one medical case against you, you spend hours and hours and hours trying to write reports, trying to, you know, reanalyze things. And, and, and it is a nightmare. And we have been through that. All of us who are into years of practice, we've been through that. And I promise you, it is not a pleasant experience at all. So my suggestion is nowadays life has become very easy. It's all there on your app. It's all there on your computer. Just fill in the stuff. Whatever figure it spews out, you are legally, medically, and ethically obliged to quote the same figures. You cannot underscore the risk to a patient or to a relative just because your neighbor down the road is not telling the truth. So be very, very careful in your clinical practice. Please, please do not understratify a risk. The worst thing to happen to a patient is risk. And, and it is your responsibility that you make sure that the risk to the patient is as low as possible. 
And, and it, it is possible that when you start off with the patient, the risk may be high, particularly in thoracic surgery. When we start off, the PFTs may be very poor. Okay, the FEV1 may be, may be not 0.8. That does not mean that you quote them a lower number of risk to get them onto your operating table. A better way to do it is put them through the uh, pulmonary rehabilitation program and repeat the PFTs six weeks down the road. And many, many times in my clinical practice, I have found that patients who came to me first and who were unfit for surgery, who had been offered surgery by other surgeons, to be honest. And I have said, listen, you are high risk for surgery, but let's put you through some antibiotics, some you know, uh, bronchodilators, uh, vigorous physiotherapy, yoga. And then when I have done them six weeks down the road, the numbers have significantly improved and I have had time to operate on them. So do not rush into the operating theater. Never, ever, ever make the mistake of rushing into the operating theater, particularly in private practice. People are worried that if the patient goes back, you know, you will lose the patient. Please realize all these things that are there, which Asghar told you about, these are tools to help you make a genuine assessment of the risk of the patient. And these tools are, are, are based on thousands and thousands of patients. The calculation is not just on two, three patients or in my experience. No, it's based on genuine facts on thousands and thousands of patients. And so use this tool to your advantage. And when you tell the patient and you show the app to the patient and say, look, this is what I put in, this is how it's calculated. The patients will actually believe you and they will come back to you. And more importantly, they will come back with another patient two years down the road. That's the important thing. Most of practice works on word of mouth. And if you're truthful and you're honest with the patient from the word go, I promise you, you may lose one patient, but you'll get 10 back. So do not worry about it. Use these tools to your advantage. They are all been designed. They are not accurate. None of the tools are accurate. All of them are only estimations. And you, you may be better than what the scores may predict actually. But if you have that much experience behind you, then use your own numbers. It's okay. Now in my practice, I use my own numbers. I say, this is my experience. I've done 300 of these cases in the past and this is my mortality and this is my outcome. And I'm confident enough to do that because you have years of practice. So those, there are three phases of practice. The first phase, uh, is, is when you are really scared and you, you want to make sure you don't have complication. And that's okay. That, that is a phase where you are very careful. It is the second phase, which is more dangerous. It's when you've done 100, 200 cases, that's when you start getting a bit, you know, like a cowboy. You want to prove that you, you can do it. Same thing, it happens with VATS, with the robotic surgery. The first 10, 15 cases, you're happy to convert. It is when you get into the second phase of life, when you are pushing to show that you can do it by VATS or you can do it by robotics, that's when you push so much that you have a supra major complication and you lose a patient. So the second phase is something that you've got to watch out for. And then you come to the third phase at, at my level where very early in the game, you know this is not possible by VATS or this is not possible by robotics and you convert and it's not a problem. So it's very, very important that you must use these tools as a ability, and you must say this in the FRCS exam as well, that you use these tools to convey some information to you to be able to make a sensible judgment that this is safe for the patient. Cameron, you wanted to say something. You, you wanted to come yeah. back in. Yeah, uh, I basically, the key, as you said, Z uh, Zamir, is that um, this theme is, is not an academic, this is all about professionalism and at the heart of, we, we don't just want to pass an exam, we just don't want to impress an examiner, but we actually want to make you good, safe, professional surgeon at the heart of that. And that's where this topic comes in, is integrity. And that integrity is firstly about being open with the patient. Secondarily, it's about your own personal data collection. So when you collect your data, and this is a very important theme, because there used to be, you know, surgeons put the data into the database, your data gets collected, 
you get a report and based on that you see what your risk stratified mortality there were cases unfortunately where surgeons were gaming and what is gaming we know about match fixing happens a lot unfortunately but gaming is when you can put in variables you can say your patients were you can't change the age that's a bit more difficult to sort of uh, falsify but people were saying well the lv functions a little bit poorish they would say that the patients are a little bit unstable there used to be practices where sometimes that they would adjust a few of the variables to make the euro score higher and there was a, a case uh, where uh, uh, where surgeons had said the patients were on certain gtn infusions which up that makes it makes the risk score much higher and so that is something we have to avert and there were concerns that gaming is, is happening because the people who enter the data are the surgeons themselves so you have to be transparent in in what you say transparent in your data entry and ultimately as amir says that is what will, will come back and you have to stand by because it's your personal reputation your personal integrity and these issues are you know all the models have their limitations and um one of the, you know, the, the key factors is that we have to use what model is out there. And there is a particularly, a, there, there's a, a, a statistician whose name is George Box. I'll just find, I'll share this quote with you because it's very timely. Um, and what he had said is that, um, there we go. George Box. Can you see this, see that screen? Yes. So he said, he, he's, not a med, he's not a surgeon, he was a statistician in 1976 in the Journal of American Statistical. He said, all models are wrong. So every model has its limitation, but some are useful. And so as we, things are evolving, we, models will evolve. And the current models that we have are based upon you know, multinational databases, the Euroscore is European, the STS score. And so all of them have their limitations, but we, they have their uses, so we use that. We're entering the era now where actually what's happening is that the way that we look at data, the way we collect data, now we have big data, there's already better systems of analyzing that. So it's being used a lot in cardiology and cardiovascular, machine learning and deep learning. And those algorithms are being applied and they're showing actually, rather than using logistic euro modeling, those will give much better modeling and give real time modeling as well. So I think we're in an exciting phase where, as Amir says, the data is out there. A patient came to me three weeks ago or four weeks ago. He, he had severe aortic stenosis. He said, Mr. Baig, I, I know your results. You've got 98.29%. That's your, that's your results. So I looked that up. It's really good. I said, well, I, I, that's for every operator. Patients know beforehand. I said for the operation I'm doing, my mortality is probably lower, you know, but the patients come with information or they'll ask you, how many operations of these have you done? That's what, now we, we're in that environment. When I, so you have to be very transparent. You have to show them what you've done. And if you have limited experience, and this is where what Zamir says, you have to ask for help. You get a colleague, you get people to come and help you. And that way you can, you know, do the best for the patient. It's not about personal pride and ego. You have to do what's best for the patient and to support your own development. Okay. The key that you point, the other point that you made was, so the first few years you spend being very cautious. We, all of us will be trained, whether you're a trainee, whether you're a junior consultant, we have this, you know, we have this learning curve. We go up this curve when we're developing skills. And then we get to a point where we, we, we know we can do a procedure competently, safely, with very good results. And we're in, a, we're in this zone called the comfort zone. Now, People like Zamir, he was in that comfort zone a long time ago, but he could have stayed there, but he innovated. He went to the next level. He went somewhere beyond. He, he, you know, when he was, we were training, everyone was doing open lobectomy. That He was one of the pioneers of that lobectomy as a trainee. And then the next level was actually taking it to robotics. So you go from the, the area where you're initially very comfortable, but you have to then go outside your comfort zone and you have to take it into a level where you have to be actually quite brave. You're going into an area where it's called the terror zone. You're terrified. And once you come through that fear and then you become courageous and then that's how we build the frontiers, but not at the cost of the patient. We have to do it in, with the right environment, with the right governance. That's what I think when you study for this exam, 
we can learn that good clinical governance is at the heart of everything that we do because we want to have something that's going to audit we're going to look at our outcomes we're going to collect the data and then we're going to reassess and so that is you know the, the key at the heart of all of this yeah. 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 the um, person who pays the price is is the, the patient. patient yeah no can, I, get, can i just add uh, this yeah, only yeah, shortly sure. So I actually echo uh, what Kamran yourself has said, and uh, for my colleagues here, you know, because I'm a, a relatively junior consultant, so I came. This is my transition phase, and I tell you the, the I, I give you actually the practical example. So one of my senior surgeon during my training days used to say, "So when you're operating cases, you if you have a good outcomes, you keep going like this upwards the curve." Your, your own confidence, not only the competence, but your own confidence level keeps going up as well. And then you take on some complex or difficult cases. And if there is a bad outcome or mortality, it curves, it shakes you and it brings you right down. So there are phases, you know, during your development, professional development, and that affects your uh, decision making as well. And the another example is uh, when I uh, went and learned my uni portal, and I learned uni portal like yourself, Mr. Khan. I was a trainee, so I came back and started doing uni portal. And one day I was doing a relatively tough case, and my boss came in and um, he said, "What's happening?" I said, "It seems to be slightly difficult here." He said, "Look, I don't do words, but I would say to you, you make." this is your call to make a judgment here. So if you think you can safely proceed, if it is taking long, doesn't matter because every case is different. But if you think you can safely proceed, take a little bit longer, but proceed, but then review your decision. But if you think you cannot safely proceed and you want to do some heroic thing here, and if you do something wrong and I have to get and bail you out, that would be regarded as failure failure to judgment. But if you either convert now, or if even if you want to proceed, take some more time, this will be a, a success. Even if you have to convert, but it still will be regarded as a success because you are making a good decision for the safety of your own patient. You're not doing just something heroic. And similarly, very recently I did, I was uh, referred a very complex, uh, uh, not complex, a high risk patient basically who had a recent TIA, so symptomatic TIA, and on further investigation, we found bilateral carotid stenosis, more than 80%. He's got a stent in the coronaries. He is a current smoker, current heavy smoker. Now, he doesn't have a diagnosis. Here comes the challenge. How did you make the decision? He has got borderline uh, PFTs and he has got COPD as well. Now, technically, it was an easier thing to do um, a frozen section and proceed to lobectomy because from his performance status and as you know as thoracic surgeons we know that you know sometimes the PFT although they may guide you but performance status in practicality is more important to look on to how this patient will do after the operation. His performance status relatively looked good but we have to consider the overall picture not just that technical aspect that I can do this where it's either robotic or with the virus way very quickly. Here comes the judgment call. So after discussion with my other senior colleagues who were very kindly there to advise me, we monitored the cerebral saturation by the nerves of this patient because of the throat problem. And we wanted a quick in and out operation. So we did a, you know, it was 1.7 centimeter. So we did a bigger wedge with the lymph node sampling and come out of this because in this patient who's got borderline lung functions where you don't have a diagnosis and the patient has got you know, symptomatic TIA with coronary disease, you don't want to perform heroic thing. On the other hand, someone could say easily, oh, you know, I would have done a lobectomy, it could have been done. But every patient judgment is different, plus you have to look on to your own practice as well. And as you very rightly said, don't just look at, oh, um, you know, I would just do this case. No, you want to have a good run of cases, you want to develop your competence and you want to have a professional development, then you do uh, difficult bits afterwards. 
Yeah. The one thing uh, we see in the examination quite often, and this is for the students who are exam going, is that uh, people uh, are, are worried to talk about common things. Uh, you know, people think that if they talk about the advanced techniques, they will get more credit in the exam. Actually, it's completely the opposite. It's completely the opposite. I want you to say, I will do open thoracotomy, lobectomy, and get out. And that is completely acceptable. Because if you say, I would do a case by VATS, uh, my next question to you would be, how many VATS have you done? And if the answer is five, then, then I, I, my assessment is that you're not a safe surgeon. Your, your decision-making is suspect. Do, do you understand that? So very, very often in the exams, I've seen people come in and talk about robotic surgery and I'll do this by robotics because they think I am a robotic surgeon. So they will impress me by saying that, you know, I would do this by robotics. And, and it's, it's completely the opposite. I want to know what would you do in your practice? When I ask you a question, what is the operation that you would do in this patient in your hands? The answer should be, I would do open sternotomy, thymectomy and out. Because that is your competence. You have done one robotics in your life and, and you cannot in an exam expect me, you know, by trying to please me and say, I would do this as a robotic thymectomy. That is not acceptable in the exam. So be very careful. I have seen this many, many times. And because I do all these high end complicated, you know, technological uh, stuff, and most of my talks are technological, people think that they want to impress me with, with technology. But actually, it's completely the opposite. I want to know what you would do at your level. That is the answer I want. And perfectly all right for me if you say open thoracotomy and lobectomy. All right, so please, please be very careful. Do not jump into the minimally invasive bandwagon in, a, in an exam scenario. Please do not. In fact, it's much more safer to stay uh, you know, open surgery because no matter how, may, how hard we try, open surgery is still the gold standard. And when I say gold standard, what I mean, my understanding of that is that when things go wrong, what is my access? That is my understanding of a gold standard. So in a VATS, if things go wrong, and if I want to save a patient's life, I open the chest. And so that still remains a gold standard. The youngsters fail to understand this. They think that, you know, They've got big balls if they say, you know, I can do this by VATS or I can do it by uniportal VATS or I can do it by two. Absolutely wrong. What you have to think about is what will I do when things go wrong? How will I save the patient's life? And no matter how hard you try to convince me, the gold standard remains the operation which will save the patient's life. So do not in the exam try to jump in and say, I would do minimally invasive. Do not, do not. My advice to you is do not. Say that some people do it, but in my institution, in my practice, in my hands, I would do this open surgery, okay? Now I'm gonna ask the audience if there's anybody who's got any pressing questions to ask. I'm, I'm quite happy to put it to the uh, panel. Anybody's got any pressing questions you would like to ask because we're getting to the two hour mark. So we need to uh, call this session to a close, but please, please take this opportunity to ask some questions. Is there anybody who's got any questions to ask? Are there any uh, chats uh, pending? No, okay. So we have got a lot of audience on YouTube and uh, the IX group who unfortunately cannot uh, ask questions because uh, I am not monitoring the, the YouTube chat at the moment. Uh, so thank you very much, everybody. Kamran, did you want to say something? I, I saw you switch on your video. No, it's fine, thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you, Asgar, for an excellent talk. Uh, I really enjoyed it. What I loved was the simplicity of your talk. Uh, it, it is really important that we keep things very simple. It's important that we have just one, two or three uh, ways of assessing a patient. And in my personal opinion, I think you should stick to one, just one, but master it, okay? Master that, use technology. These, all these uh, scores are available on apps. None of us can remember this. Even today, if you ask me the TNM, and I, I am very actively involved with TNM, but I still use apps to remind me because you kind of forget in day-to-day -day life. So please use apps to score your thing. In your clinic, get used to it. Nowadays, we are living in a different world where smartphones have become 
part of our life. Please score every single patient. Do not think it's a routine CABG or it's a routine lobectomy. Please use uh, the various uh, you know, risk factors and score the patient. And the most important point which I want to make to everybody is do not forget to document. The most important thing in all of this is documentation. I don't care how you did it, but if you didn't document it, it did not happen. And that is the message which has to go across to all juniors. And it's absolutely okay to add it to the consent form. The documentation should be on the consent form. And uh, we have done uh, talks on valid informed consent and maybe in future, if you want, we can repeat them. But once again, Asgar and Kamran, thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate your input for the young surgeons and uh, hopefully we'll be back again uh, with more talks uh, for the learning of the juniors. Good night to everybody and uh, have a 